Um, we have a few items to take up. And let's take up the scheduling item first. I just learned that a message from the clerk to Mr. Boutros apparently was not delivered or not received. Um, that we have cleared the calendar and will be able to continue the trial tomorrow. Um, the clerk put a call into Ms. Boutros to that effect and to Mr. Thompson and requested each to notify everybody else. Apparently Mr. Thompson did not do so and Mr. Boutros apparently didn't receive the message. But be that as it may, we're ready to continue the trial tomorrow and we'll proceed as expeditiously as possible. And Your Honor, I would like to apologize. I had assumed that it was informed counsel on our side. I had not realized that uh, I was supposed to coordinate and I picked up the message on Tuesday morning, but I do apologize to the court. Very well, I accept that. I, <clears throat> I understand. Now we have some discovery and other matters to uh, deal with. Um, the first is proponent's objection to the magistrate's uh, discovery order and we just filed a written order uh, on that objection a few moments ago. It's very brief. The bottom line is that uh, the magistrate's order I do not believe is clearly erroneous, which is the standard. In fact, I think it's uh, quite correct. And so the discovery order by Magistrate Judge Spiro will remain uh, undisturbed. The second is proponent's motion to amend the January 8 uh, discovery order to add four names to the core group designation. Um, I tried to communicate with Magistrate Judge Spiro this morning to see if he's available to hear that. Um, I did, was unable to reach him. In as much as that was a matter before him, it might make sense for him to hear that in the first instance. Uh, but I don't want that reference to delay matters. And so uh, if he's unavailable to hear that matter and to give a decision before, say, midday today, uh, I'd prefer to rule on that based upon the submissions here. But what I'll have the clerk do is to try to reach him and see what his availability is, and then at least one lawyer from each side can go and discuss the matter with him and uh, take up the issue. As I understand it, the proponents wish to add four names to the uh, core group designation, a Mr. Criswell, a Mr. Worthlin, a John Doe, and I've forgotten the, uh, the fourth party you're seeking. Uh, Rob Worthlin. Worthlin, yes. Sorry, Andrew Puno for the uh, defendant intervenors. It's Mr. Rob Worthlin is the fourth. I mentioned Worthlin. I'm sorry, I, Your Honor. It's uh, Richard Peterson is the first. Peterson, yeah. that's right. Okay. <clears throat> and then we have the plaintiff's motion to reopen the deposition of Mr. Prentice. Um, we haven't had a response on that. At least I haven't seen one. But I wonder, Mr. Boutros, whether we really need to have a further deposition of Mr. Prentice. As I understand the situation, you believe that you've discovered documents which call into question the deposition testimony that Mr. Prentice gave. Why can you not simply take that up in your examination of him? When is he going to be called as a witness? We have listed him, Your Honor, at, for I think um, th th for third tomorrow or, f or Friday, um, and and we we thought it would one number one streamline things if we were able to just walk through these documents with them. There, that is a fairly voluminous group of documents, which might either make it unnecessary for us to call him live if we're talking about authenticating documents, or at least would spare the court some uh, lengthy. Uh, walking through documents and asking them what they are and, and that sort of thing. And, and so I don't think it needs to be a really long deposition, but we thought it, for everyone it would be better to just 
do a, do a deposition, walk through the documents, and then streamline things in the court. And, and uh, we thought that would be a preferable way to approach it. Bonus to have a view. Uh, Ms. Moss. Um, and I apologize for not having a copy with me, but we did just file our opposition this morning, and I'm trying to get one printed now. Um, our position is we are opposed to reopening the deposition of Mr. Prentice. Uh, he was deposed for 14 hours, uh, both as the 30B6 and in his ind individual capacity. Um, and we believe that they, their papers suggested they had 25 documents that they wanted to go over with him. And we believe that to the extent they think that there's inconsistencies with his testimony, they can explore that on the stand. And that it would be highly prejudicial to us to have to both sit through his deposition at the same time that it's the day before they're saying they're going to put him on the stand, we wouldn't have the ability to really prepare him for his testimony. So we would ask that it not be reopened or at a minimum that it be not the seven hours that they've requested, but at most an hour. Um, we would take two hours, Your Honor. <laughs> and, and if I could just respond to the suggestion that it's the proponents who are sort of on the, getting the short end of the stick on the fairness equation. the proponents withheld these documents, refused to answer, let Mr. Prentice answer questions on things that were clearly within discovery, and Magistrate Spiro, when he heard the arguments and ruled, found that, that, it, that they were, the relevance arguments were entirely frivolous and I think he said outrageous at one point because they were clearly documents and things that were within the, disc the realm of discovery in this court's order and the Ninth Circuit's order. So we have been proceeding with extreme diligence. We had teams reviewing these documents um, for the last week. Um, these documents should have been produced well before Mr. Prentice's deposition. So we think that we're, we're making a modest request for a short deposition which will benefit everyone and in, including helping streamline the proceedings. I'm inclined to agree with Ms. Moss. Um, I have not forgotten what it's like to try cases and take depositions at the same time. That's uh, difficult under any circumstances. And it seems to me you'll be able to cross-examine or to examine Mr. Prentice. Uh, and if there are, in fact, inconsistencies between his deposition testimony and the evidence that's now been produced, you'll be able to explore that. And it will be, uh, can be done just as effectively here at trial as with a further deposition. It may take a little more time with the authentic authentication of documents, but we're in trial, so uh, let's proceed. And then I believe the only other matter is the proponent's uh, objection to the next witness. Oh, all right. Uh, let's uh, let's tidy, tidy up those loose ends. Yesterday, I did uh, maintain a provisional objection to a couple of the documents, uh, as you may recall, that Mr. Boys uh, introduced into evidence. It was PX0188 and PX0189. Uh, since uh, uh, I'm of that provisional objection, my, my friends uh, for the plaintiffs have provided the uh, confirmation that those were indeed provided to us. Very well. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Cooper. Um, then I believe the only other remaining matter is the uh, uh, issue of the Ryan Kendall testimony. Yes, Your you Honor. Are Mr. Uh, James Campbell for the defendant Campbell. interveners. Um, Took the deposition. That is correct, Your Honor. Um, just I, as I understand, Your Honor is familiar with with the deposition. But I read just the deposition. As a brief, uh, you know, background: Mr. Kendall is a man from Colorado whose parents forced him, uh, against his will, to, to attend some type of um, sexual orientation conversion therapy, and that is the nature of his testimony in this case. Uh, we believe that there are at least four reasons why his testimony should be excluded. Uh, from, from this case. Uh, first of all, Mr. Kendall's testimony is, is irrelevant. Um, he can only testify about his limited experience, which deals with 
involuntary forced conversion therapy. And it is our position, Your Honor, that that is wholly irrelevant to this court's analysis. Um, secondly, to the extent that this issue is at all relevant, it is the proper subject of expert testimony, not lay testimony. Uh, simply put, one man's anecdotal account of his experience with a particular type of conversion therapy uh, is irrelevant to this court's analysis. It, it's no more relevant than if the defendant intervenors uh, found uh, some individual and asked them to uh, elicit testimony about a positive experience they had with this type of testimony. So we would just urge the court that uh, this is the proper um, subject of expert testimony, if it is at all relevant. Um, and further to that point, Your Honor, um, the plaintiff and plaintiff intervenors have already identified an expert, uh, Dr. Herrick, who in his expert report has already opined on the issue of conversion therapy. So if it's relevant, he can discuss it. And finally, Your Honor, I think uh, this perhaps is one of the more, more important points. Um, plaintiff and plaintiff intervenors' own expert, Dr. Herrick, has indicated that self-reports of conversion therapy from many years ago, which of course is the type of uh, testimony that we'll re be receiving from Mr. Kendall, is unreliable, often inaccurate, and unhelpful for serious analysis. And what I'm referring to specifically, Your Honor, is uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2563, which I have some copies of. Um, this document, Your Honor, is um, Dr. Herrick's commentary on a study of conversion therapy conducted by a person named Spitzer. And if I could direct the courts, um, specifically, Dr. Herrick says, um, makes some comments here about self-reporting of conversion therapy, and I think that they're particularly enlightening um, in, this, in this context. What he says on page 438 of this document uh, and it's the last paragraph on that page, just the first couple sentences. Uh, I quote, even if Spitzer's respondents sincerely tried to give true accounts of their feelings and daily behavior from, on average, 12 years prior to the interview, their reports cannot be assumed to be reliable. People often are inaccurate when recalling earlier mental states, especially when their emotions, goals, or beliefs have changed in the interim. And he goes on further, Your Honor. So. Uh, I guess our, our position on that point is their own expert recognizes that this, this type of um, self-reporting isn't helpful for a serious analysis. Let me ask you, Mr. Campbell, isn't this an issue that the proponents themselves have raised and have opened in the case? I don't believe that we've, we've raised the issue of, of forced conversion therapy, Your Honor. Well, I'm looking at your trial brief. And you say the evidence at trial will show that many people freely choose their sexual orientation. Goes on, the evidence will further demonstrate that however it is defined, sexual orientation can shift over time and does so for a significant number of people. And the proposed findings that the proponents have submitted include such items as no aspect of sexual orientation has been shown to be immutable. An individual's sexual orientation can change over the course of a lifetime. Research shows that many individuals' sexual orientation does change over the course of a lifetime. Women's sexual orientation tends to be particularly fluid, malleable, shaped by life experiences, and capable of change over time. And for many people, adopting a particular so sexual orientation is a conscious choice. So these are findings that you yourself have put in. And or that's, at least that's your correct. Colleagues. And so it seems to me you have raised the very issue to which this witness is going to testify. I, I think the critical distinction, Your Honor, is that we, we don't ever mention any type of forced or um, structured therapy that would bring about these changes. Our, our position in this case and our position in those, in those factual findings are that these changes do occur. Um, whether or not they occur through uh, some type of structured therapy is not an issue that's relevant. Um, the, the, the bottom line is that the change occurs and that is what's relevant to um, determining whether a, a suspect classification applies here. What evidence are you going to present on this? 
Well, extensive. Are you going to present evidence that people have successfully changed their sexual orientation? We believe that through um, various cross-examinations of some of the upcoming witnesses, as well as potentially through some of our own, we will we will show that, Your Honor, exactly what you just mentioned, that, that people... Other than cross-examination, how do you intend to show this? Well, um, you know, there, as I said, we, we may call our own witnesses to, to show this, our own experts to show this, but it is something that we primarily intend to show through um, cross-examination of, of the plaintiff's expert. I see. As well as whatever's on this note. Oh. Always handy to receive a note from <laughs> um, one of your as, colleagues. As well as through, through st studies, Your Honor. Studies. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which we will introduce through um, on cross and, and other various means. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. And by the way, I think you took a good deposition. Um, well, it does seem to me that this is an issue that the proponents themselves have uh, raised in the case, uh, the fluidity of sexual orientation. It's true that this is an issue which largely depends upon uh, expert testimony. But as with so many aspects of testimony in a trial and evidence in a trial, actual first-hand experience to illustrate points that have been raised uh, are, is very helpful. And, well, you're not the only one, Mr. Campbell, to receive notes. <laughs> Uh, is very helpful, and I think the testimony of Mr. Uh, Kendall on this issue can be evaluated by the court and weighed uh, in relation to the expert testimony and all the other evidence that's going to be presented, and so I'm disinclined to exclude uh, his testimony. He has, after all, been deposed. Mr. Campbell has had a chance to uh, explore uh, this uh, gentleman's testimony and to uh, prepare himself, and so I think it's uh, not unfair to the proponents having raised this issue for Mr. Kendall to testify, and therefore the motion to exclude him will be denied. Now, uh, the note I just been handed is that Magistrate Judge Spiro can hear the core group issue right now. So if you would designate um, one of your number to hightail it to Magistrate Judge <laughs> Spiro. He can uh, hear the matter and and render a decision. Very well, very well, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Pena will, is taking the lead for, for our side on, Good. on these, uh, these subject matters. And I'm sending Mr. McGill in for that one. All right. <laughs> well, I believe uh, Mr. Boutros, you're calling the next witness, are you? Or? Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to uh, have Mr. Boyes explain. We're going to first play some video clips of depositions as a prelude to today's testimony from our witnesses. Mr. Boyes, would you like All right, to? Right, Mr. Boyes. Uh, Your Honor, we're going to uh, play uh, deposition designations from uh, Dr. Uh, Paul. Deposition designations from Dr. Paul Nathanson, and then follow that with deposition designations from Professor Catherine Young. Uh, both of these um, individuals were um, designated experts um, uh, from the defendants, uh, but their uh, the defendants have withdrawn them. I'm not going to be calling them live. Let's see. Catherine Young, she does appear... Yes, to have been designated by the defendants. And the other one is Mr. Nathanson? Yes, Paul Nathanson, Dr. Paul Nathanson. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, <clears throat> before we <clears throat> excuse me, get underway on that, I do want to uh, uh, recall the, uh, to the Court's attention the uh, uh, discussion about this that uh, happened 
a, f a few trial days ago uh, with Mr. Thompson, these witnesses were uh, withdrawn at their insistence. And uh, and I understand that Mr. Boys is going to uh, going to submit these to the court um, uh, under uh, uh, under judicial notice. Uh, 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 an offer of judicial notice, <clears throat> and we uh, we are fine with that, or we're, we 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 will not object to that. Although we do believe that under those circumstances, it would be necessary for us to be allowed to uh, also submit to the court the expert witness reports that provide the basis for these. Uh, deposition questions and these designations, and also, also to offer to the court uh, counter designations as soon as we are able to uh, determine what they're putting on and, and can identify uh, counter designations from the deposition, if the court please. Your Honor, uh, we gave them these designations a week ago. Uh, in fact, we told them we might play them last Thursday or Friday, depending on the timing. Um, so they, they've had the deposition designations. Um, uh, these are clearly admissible under 32, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's subsection four, A24, four, I think, A24, 32A24, I think <clears throat> it is, um, uh, where a, a, dep a, a witness is, uh, more than 100 miles away, and we did not procure the witness's absence. And I think they would also be admissible under uh, judicial notice, but I think they're, they're admissible as evidence under um, 32. Uh, A4B, 32A4B. Well, let's see. Where are these uh, folks located? Uh, Montreal, Canada. Mont both of them? Both of them. Well, that's more than 100 miles from San Francisco. <laughs> I, I, I took their deposition, so I know exactly where they are and how cold it is there. <laughs> right? Well, there are probably multiple grounds upon which uh, the testimony is admissible. Clearly, if there are counter designations that uh, the proponents wish to have the court consider, they may do so, although if it's correct, Mr. Uh, Cooper, that you received these designations a week ago, I would think you'd be able to get in your counter designations by now. But I'm not going to foreclose you from making counter designations once you hear the testimony. So, all right. <clears throat> Do you know uh, what position um, the American Anthropolog Anthropological Association uh, takes, if any, uh, with respect to the issue of gay marriage? They support it. They support it. Um, do you know uh, what the position, if any, of the American Psychoanalytical Analytic Association is with respect to gay marriage? They support it. Do you know what the position of the American Psychological Association is, if any, with respect to gay marriage? They support it. Do you know what the position is of the American Psychiatric Association with respect it. to gay marriage, if any? They support it. Are you familiar with the American Academy of Pediatrics? No. No, I'm sorry, I am. Uh, and, and they also support it. They also support what? Um, uh, gay marriage. Uh, do you know um, any of the reasons why the American Academy of Pediatrics supports gay marriage? They see no problem for children. Now, um, using opinion in the sense that you do as a researcher, do you have an opinion as to whether permitting gay people to marry increases the stability and commitment of their relationship. It increases. 
it increases the stability and commitment of their relationship. That's right. Um, uh, as a researcher using the term opinion the way you've defined it, um, do you have an opinion as to whether permitting gay people to marry increases their happiness and sense of security and well-being? Objection, this is beyond the scope of this expert report. I think it does. Well, let's, let's try to break that down in, into two parts. Um, first, you recognize that uh, gay couples are today raising children, correct? Yes. And you believe that enabling those gay couples to marry would enhance their ability to be good parents to the children they're raising, correct? Yes. Are you aware of any peer-reviewed studies that have been published as to whether permitting gay people to marry affects the rearing of children? Yes. And what peer-reviewed studies of that type are you aware of? Sociological and psychological ones. Um, and those are uh, sociological and psychological uh, studies published by the various associations we've identified? Yes. And what do those peer-reviewed studies conclude, if you understand it? They don't detect problems, and they don't predict problems. And uh, when, when you say disorder, do you mean that the Catholic Church no longer believes homosexual activity, in your opinion, mm -hmm. uh, to be gravely immoral? They do. They do believe it's greatly more. Yes. Today? Yes. Okay. And do they say that? I don't know what words they use, but they certainly have made it clear that it is um, prohibited. Which means that it is immoral and outside of the order of God. And a sin? Yes. Um, um, and um, and that's what the uh, the Catholic Church teaches its adherents, correct? That's correct. Let me start with the biggest Protestant church in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, and that and that you described as what? Southern Baptist Convention. Um, and um, uh, how does the Southern ba ba Baptist Convention describe homosexual behavior? Sinful. They describe it as evil? Um, some probably do. Well, does the Southern Baptist Convention itself describe homosexual behavior as evil? I haven't seen statements with that word, but uh, there's no... I, I would be inclined to say that there pro some do. Um, does the Southern Baptist Convention describe um, homosexual behavior as a perversion? Yes. As an abomination? Yes. As deviant behavior? Yes. As a manifestation of a depraved nature? Yes. Does the... Um, teachings of the Southern Baptist Convention, as you understand it, um, with respect to gay people, um, represent what you described uh, earlier uh, as uh, hostility yes. to gay people. Let me ask you to turn um, to page 17 and um, you say in paragraph 50 that a few religious people do say now and then that quote God hates gay people close quote you yes. see that? and that's that's something that you put in quotes yes where does that quote come from? 
uh, comes from a, a picture in a newspaper of some protesters. I don't, it wasn't in California, um, but it, it was about gay marriage. And they were carrying a placard that says, God hates gay people. Do you have an opinion as to um, what the proportion was of the uh, people in California that uh, voted on Proposition 8, that were motivated primarily by religious reasons? Um, I'd say about half. Um, uh, and uh, of the people who were motivated by religious reasons primarily in voting on Proposition 8, um, uh, what proportion of those people voted in favor of Proposition 8, in your opinion, if you have it? And calls for speculation. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, would you ag agree that up until the last 50 years, both religion and societies have been very hostile to homosexuality? Yes. Um, and that this hostility has caused homosexuals to be discriminated against? Is that correct? Yes. Um, and uh, indeed uh, placed in physical danger, correct? Yes. Are you aware of uh, any studies or analyses as to how society's hostility to homosexual, homosexuals and homosexuality affected the psychology of homosexuals? Texas is outside the scope of the I'm aware that there have been, in fact, studies. And, and, and have those studies uh, reached um, uniform conclusions? Yes. And what are the uniform conclusions that those studies have reached? That being at the targets of hatred or hostility is a bad thing. It has bad effects on people. Now, do you have an opinion as to uh, taking the Roman Catholic uh, uh, Church first? Uh, what proportion of Roman Catholics uh, accept the Church's teachings that homosexual activity is a disorder and gravely immoral? Not more than half. Now, you, um, uh, you use um, uh, the term um, uh, hate or hatred um, uh, in your writings. And would you define what you mean by that? Culturally propagated hostility. In other words, I don't classify it as an emotion, I classify it as a cultural force. And I take it you would agree that there is what you refer to as culturally propagated hostility uh, towards gay people. There is some, yes. Um, and um, uh, would it be your opinion that um, uh, historically there was a great deal of culturally propagated hostility towards great gay people? Yes. Are, are you familiar with the term gay bashing? Yes. And what does that term refer to? Attacks, physical attacks on gay people, or at least perceived gay people. That is sometimes people are attacked because they are perceived to be gay people, even when they're not. Yes. Um, but they are attacks that are directed, physical attacks that are directed against people who are perceived by the attackers to be gay. Yes, as in the case of Matthew Shepard. Yes. Uh, and would you define for the record who Matthew Shepard was and what happened? He was a student in um, 
where was it, Wisconsin, uh, who was attacked by some people who saw him coming out of a bar, a gay bar, and, um, and killed. He was left impaled on a fence. And when did that happen? Um, that could have been seven or eight years ago. Um, we talked about how uh, there were uh, religions that supported gay marriage and there were religions that um, uh, believed that homosexual activity was a sin. Um, and there were religions that um, supported Proposition 8 and there were religions that opposed Proposition 8. Remember yes. that? Um, now, is it true that the uh, religions that supported Proposition 8, that sought to ban gay marriage, were much larger than the religions that supported gay marriage? Yes. And the uh, religions that uh, supported Proposition 8 and opposed um, gay marriage um, contributed many more volunteers um, to the campaign effort than the religions that supported gay marriage and opposed Proposition 8, correct? Yes. Let me ask you... Um, question about the hostility and to uh, gay people and, and what we refer to as gay bashing. Um, do you believe that the teaching of certain religions that homosexual relations are a sin and an abomination um, contributes to gay bashing? Yes. Is it your opinion that the primary cause of the culturally propagated hostility uh, is religious teachings. I that might be a complex answer. Let me start by saying that, um, in a, in a direct sense, yes. But I think that religious hostility to homosexual behavior, in turn, has roots other than religion. With respect to blacks, um, was religion or religious doctrine used to justify the prejudice against blacks? I'm checked that this is outside the scope of his expert report. Yes. Um, uh, uh, and uh, did the defenders of um, the prejudice or stereotypes against blacks uh, argue that the discrimination was somehow uh, protective of the family? Yes. And um, uh, was religion or religious doctrine used to justify the prejudice against women? Object again outside the scope report. Uh, yes. And did the defenders of the prejudice or stereotypes against women argue that the discrimination against women um, was important to protecting the family? Yes. Objection. Twenty-three fifty-four. Thirty-four. I beg your pardon. Twenty-three thirty-four. Very well.
Well, and 40, 2546 is the CD of the testimony that we've just heard, correct? Copies to the court. 2546 is the CD or the disc of the testimony that we've just heard? That's correct. All right. I just want to uh, reassert my previously stated objection and also uh, note that uh, that uh, we will offer the court our, our counter designations uh, with, with uh, appreciation for the court's uh, uh, permission uh, tomorrow. That'll be fine. Very well. <clears throat> Are we ready with another witness? Well, there's no objection to the resume of Dr. Young. Very well. We also have this testimony, which is Plaintiff's Exhibit 2544. 2544. 544? 544, which is the testimony. Well. And um, your Honor, again, subject to my previously stated uh, uh, points. That'll be fine, uh, Mr. Cooper. <clears throat> In the course of the work that you have done, um, have you come to form an opinion as to whether uh, gay people uh, have been historically the subject of prejudice and discrimination. Yes, there have been certainly points in history where that has been true. Have there been some cultures that have been tolerant of homosexuality? Um, yes, as a subculture. Um, what are the cultures that you are aware of that have been tolerant of homosexuality? Well, I would say in the past, the Indian culture was uh, relatively tolerant. Uh, there was the tradition of the hijras, which was a sub-tradition. What was that tradition? The hijras. It was a, operated somewhat like a caste, and it was... Uh, a tradition of uh, male-to-male relationships, sometimes with a ritual that it was even akin to, uh, to marriage. But they, it was a, uh, it was never the norm for the society as a whole. It was a, uh, a sub-tradition that had a certain amount of uh, recognition to it. I'm not really that familiar with India, so this may be a very mm -hmm. obvious question. But um, are the hijra in any particular part of India? No, they're found in several different places. Uh, throughout India? Throughout India. Okay. Um, and um, uh, how long have the Hidra existed? I'm not sure where we, where we could begin to date them. It is a community today. Um, is it a community that has existed at least for centuries? I would suspect for at least a few centuries. Let me ask a simple yeah. question. 
based on everything that you know about the Hydra, yeah. how long have they existed? I would say a couple of centuries. Uh, for so, a textual documentation of this. Would you give me some examples of other exceptions from other cultures? Okay, so it's a well-known fact that the Berdash in uh, North America um, had uh, some kind of same-sex marriage in some of the tribes, not all of them. Um, and uh, could you spell that tribe for the record? It, it was not a tribe. Oh, it is a general category called Berdash. Berdash. That is a general category of people? It's a, yes, of the of, uh, same of, a category of, of people where there would be uh, same-sex relations and in some contexts, same-sex marriage. And where were these people? In the United States, Lakota, Lakota tribe, I believe. Um, so there are some uh, Plains Indians uh, groups where the Berdash was uh, a well-known phenomenon. Religious groups that had the shaman traditions, uh, the shaman traditions were often Berdash. And uh, were the Berdash regions other than North America? I believe it's a North American phenomenon under that name. Um, does the same phenomena exist in other regions under a different name? Well, um, we can take several other examples. There is considerable, uh, as a sub-tradition, not as a norm, uh, marriages... Uh, Excuse me, you said as a sub-tradition, not okay. as a norm. My definition of marriage is what works as the prevailing norm. By Once prevailing norm, you mean what most people do, correct? What most people do. Okay. Then you can have sub-traditions, okay. and we can see in several different cultures that there are sub-traditions. Okay. Um, I just want to get your nomenclature right. Okay. Um, when you're referring to the norm, you're referring to what most people do, and when you refer to uh, sub-traditions, you are referring to exceptions to the norm. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, are there other exceptions to your norm in other regions? Yes. In West Africa, there are some um, lesbian uh, marriages. Did you say West Africa? I believe it's West Africa. In China, among the silk workers, there's another example of uh, lesbian marriages. Uh, are there other um, examples uh, that you are familiar with of uh, exceptions to what you say is the, the norm of marriage uh, being limited to people of the opposite sex? Yes, we know that in Roman culture, among some of the uh, Roman emperors, there were some same-sex marriages. Um, what other examples? Well, then, there are many other examples of same-sex relationships. I'm using the examples of when there was some kind of uh, formal recognition in, uh, in the, the context of what we could call marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we could go into a long history of, of same-sex relationships uh, of which there would then be uh, quite a large, uh, quite a long history and quite a large uh, anthropological study. Is the term gay bashing a term with which you're familiar? Yes. What does that mean? Well, it can mean anything from taunting to physical assault. Do you have an opinion as to whether the bigotry and prejudice against gays and lesbians in the United States was in substantial part based on religious beliefs? 
There was a religious component to it, yes? You say there was a religious component to the prejudice and bigotry in the United States against gays and lesbians, is that correct? Yes. Um, and uh, do certain religions teach that homosexuality uh, is a sin? Yes. As you understand it, um, does the um, uh, Roman Catholic Church uh, have a view as to homosexuality activity outside of the priesthood? Do you understand the question? Yes. Yes. In general, I think that, uh, that there is a continuing view that homosexuality um, is, is wrong. Does the Roman Catholic religion uh, assert that homosexual activity among lay people is sinful? If you know. If I know. Um, I think that is the general position. Let me use your word of durability. Um, uh, do you believe that uh, children are advantaged by increasing the durability of the relationship of the couple raising them? Yes. And do you believe that the durability of the relationship of a gay couple is enhanced by permitting the gay couple to marry? On that variable, yes. And can you believe that allowing gay couples to marry will increase the durability of those gay couples' relationships, correct? Okay. I'd say yes. Okay. And increasing the durability of those relationships is beneficial to the children that they're raising, correct? On that one uh, factor, yes. Okay. And is it the case that the uh, number of children being raised um, in families that you describe as the norm was decreasing significantly before there was any gay marriage in the United States? Uh, it was decreasing. Is it the case that love and commitment are the reasons that most people give for wanting to marry? Today, probably yes. Um, uh, indeed, you have seen studies that indicate that, correct? Yes. And you have not seen any studies that indicate the contrary, correct? Correct. Um, and do you believe that love and commitment are reasons that both gay people and heterosexuals have for wanting to marry? Correct. And uh, arranged marriages uh, are declining uh, in proportion uh, and have been declining in proportion for quite a number in of years. In proportion to what? Non-arranged marriages. What you refer to as love marriages or no. choice marriages. Arranged marriages uh, have declined, it depends on the country, Islamic world, India, and so forth. So arranged marriages have declined a bit, but they certainly have not been overtaken by so-called love marriages. But they have declined, even in the places where they predominate, correct? They have declined. Um, and where arranged marriages have declined, have you seen an increase in divorce rates? Yes. Um, um, have you also found that um, divorce rates um, are correlated with female literacy? Uh, 
I cannot refer to specific studies, but I may have read something to that effect. Um, and uh, are you aware um, of a correlation between declining birth rates and increased female literacy? Yes, that correlation exists. Uh, this is a uh, statement of the American Psychoanalytic Association. Um, and um, I want to direct your attention to the position statement uh, issued by the American Psychoanalytic Association, approved January 17, 2008. Do you see that? Title Marriage Resolution? Yes, down here. Um, and uh, let me ask you to um, uh, uh, look at the, um, the marriage resolution. It begins, whereas homosexuality is a normal variant of adult sexuality. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. um, do you have any reason to disagree with that statement? Um, I would prefer to have a, a working definition of homosexuality here, but I have no basic problem with this. Okay. Um, uh, the second statement says, whereas gay men and lesbians possess the same potential and desire for sustained, loving, and lasting relationships as heterosexuals. Do you see that? Yes. Do you agree with that? Yes. Um, the next statement says, whereas same-sex couples are raising children and have the same potential and desire as heterosexual couples to love and parent children. you see that? Yes. Do you agree with that? Yes. If you have a single parent, your view is it doesn't make any difference whether that single parent is a male or a female, correct? Correct. And your opinion is it doesn't make any difference whether that single parent is gay or straight, correct? Correct. My question is, is it your view that because something was the norm in the past, it should be continued in the future? Okay, now I'll answer that question. Uh, not... Shall I answer it? Yes. Sir. Okay, not necessarily. Okay. Just because something is a norm doesn't necessarily mean it is an appropriate norm. And it has to then be reassessed in the contemporary context to see if there are good reasons why that norm should remain. We talked earlier about um, the fact that gay people um, uh, have historically been subject to prejudice and discrimination. Do you call that? Yes. Um, now, it's the case that women have also historically been subject to prejudice and discrimination, correct? Correct. And the prejudice and discrimination against women, uh, like the prejudice and discrimination against gay people, um, was often justified by religious assertions and beliefs, correct? Sometimes it was, yes. Often it was, correct? Often it was. Um, and the discrimination and prejudice against women was also often justified by the argument that it promoted or predicted or protected the traditional family, correct? Yes. And Various racial groups, including blacks, have historically been subject to prejudice and discrimination, correct? Correct. And that prejudice and discrimination, again, like the prejudice and discrimination against gays and lesbians, was often justified by religion, correct? Correct. And do you have a view as to whether States today 
law continues to be based on religion. No, because you have the doctrine of the separation of church and state. Very well. I don't believe I was handed the uh, disc of uh, Professor Young's testimony, but I got that the clerk has it. All right. Then it's 2544. All right. Why don't we take <coughs> a very brief uh, break at this time while you bring Mr. Uh, uh, Kendall forward, and then we'll resume in 10 minutes. <coughs>